I'm John Duvall. Welcome to the Scriptural Way Bible Study. The Scriptural Way Bible Study is brought to you by the Seminole Point Church of Christ, located at 16300 North May Avenue, Oklahoma City. On behalf of the elders and members of the Seminole Point Church of Christ, I would like to thank you for your interest in spiritual matters. Now, let's take our Bibles and seek the scriptural way. Good evening. I'm John Duvall. And I'm Luke Haley. I'm John Hall. And this is a scriptural way Bible study. Gentlemen, how are you all doing this evening? Fantastic. Super. John, and you? I'm doing okay. Well, good. Good. Hey, there's a thunder. We gave um, Dale the night off because Luke was available this evening and agreed to sit in and join us. I think we all agree we needed a break from Dale. <laughs> I kid. I kid. I kid. I kid. Um, I tell you what. I, I want to. I want to tell. I want to explain to you guys my level of brilliance. Okay. <laughs> when we, when we wired this broad, this new broadcast room together, I made sure that the streaming computer and the router and stuff like that will all went into our battery backup. So in the event that the power does blip out, sure we'll go in the dark for a moment, but we'll still be streaming live. But, now this is the level of brilliance, the primary router and cable modem, I forgot to plug them into a battery backup. So if we lose power, we're down. <laughs> Now, the reason why I say that is we do have some um, heavy storms moving through our area. I doubt we'll lose power, but that's always a possibility. It's good to have you with us for our study this evening. Um, Dale, as we said, Dale's not here with us tonight. He'll join us next week. We do want to let you know that beginning on June 10th, we're going to start our gospel meeting with Maurice Barnett of Phoenix, Arizona. And subsequently, that Tuesday night, we won't be having the Scripture Way broadcast but we will uh, be live streaming all the worship services. And so you can go to script, you can go to seminalpoint.org and view the services live. Brother Barnett, I've, I've never heard him before that I remember. But from what I understand, and Sister Smith has told me, he does a very fine job preaching. But he's a very scholarly man, very studied in the scriptures. He's written several books, uh, lesson books and so forth. So I think it'll be quite advantageous to have him where, here with us. And so if you're able to join us, you can go to www.seminolepoint.org and you'll see the information there regarding that gospel meeting. Now, following that Tuesday, I'm going to be gone for two weeks and John's going to be out of town. So we're going to be on a three-week hiatus from this program and then we'll pick it back up um, after the start of July there. So we'll see what we can get to this week and next week and then we'll be off for a couple weeks there. Well, let's go ahead and resume where we left off last week. If this is your first time and you've not done this before with us, just click on Guest. There you'll see the chat room and type in your name and it'll add you to the chat room and you can give us your comments and questions. I realize that with this type of, this particular subject, there may be some people out there who will disagree with the conclusions that we've drawn from the scriptures. And if that is the case, or if you think that maybe we are abusing a particular uh, passage in the scriptures, then let us know about it. You can comment directly within the chat room, or if you're viewing this at a later time, you can send your comments and questions to, to uh, questions at scripturalway.org. Now, one of the things I want to point out, just kind of remind them, we are not saying that women cannot teach. We're not saying that women cannot be effective teachers, period. Matter of fact, when he says in Acts 8, the saints was, that were scattered abroad went everywhere preaching the word, some of those would have been women. You know, going out and proclaiming the Word of God. The specific, and we're not talking about at home. We're talking about specifically in the worship service. What does the Bible say about women preachers? So that's, that's where we're at there with this tonight. Before we uh, start, any, any, Luke, this is your first night joining us on this particular topic. Any thoughts before we begin? Um, no, I think, uh, I think what we're about to get into, especially chapter 14 of 1 Corinthians and later 1 Timothy, um, I think really outlines it well, what Paul's instructions to those churches were, and of course what, we are, what, we're, going, what we're doing today. So exactly. um, I think it's pretty clear and uh, it's a good study. Now, this middle section that we're currently on, um, under work of the local church, we're talking about 
uh, reasons why the local church assembled together. And one particular purpose we talked about last week was worshiping God. Now the reason why I'm taking a brief moment to look at this is because this, these are the acts that we're talking about. You know, this is what we're looking at. So we left off last week looking at laying by in store, or to begin here this evening with this. And with this one, this is a command, 1 Corinthians 16, 1 and 2. It's the time that we come together. It is part of the worship service, but it's also part of the teaching purpose. And both men and women lay by in store. You know, just as we talked about partaking the Lord's Supper, laying by in store is something that both men and women do. Quite simple, quite clear. Uh, John, we see the same thing with singing. Right, we do. Ephesians 5, verse 19, we see there um, that any time the church assembles, we see uh, the singing that's to go on. We talk about mm -hmm. uh, the act of worship and singing. And uh, we notice there that in Ephesians 5, 19, talks about making melody in your heart unto the Lord. Right. Uh, and psalms, hymns, spiritual songs, singing those together, uh, building each other up in that, singing with grace in, our, in your hearts to the Lord. That's right. As it looks at Colossians 3, verse 16. And then, of course, the teaching that goes with that. Uh, right. The worship, of course, is there, and then the teaching goes along with that with our singing. Uh, again, back in Ephesians 5.19, as we speak to one another in psalms, hymns, and spiritual songs, teaching and admonishing one another in psalms, hymns, and spiritual songs in Colossians 3.16. So right. not only do we worship, but we teach one another. That's right. And Paul is not addressing a particular gender mm -hmm. no. in this passage. So whenever we, see, whenever we sing songs, we are teaching one another, both men and women women mm -hmm. we're praising God out loud both men and women now what we don't do is we don't have soloists this is a collective singing not one person singing before everybody but it is all of us singing together Luke we praying praying yes another act of worship an act of worship that regardless of gender everyone participates in right um, 1st Timothy chapter 2 verses 1 and 2 I exhort you first of all at supplications prayers intercessions and giving of thanks be made for all men. That includes women giving those prayers also. Mm -hmm. um, the righteous prayers are led by righteous men, serve an example to us or to those who are present um, on how to pray and what is to be prayed and what manner should be prayed. That's right. And what's interesting about this particular chapter, it's not until verse 8, I believe it is, where he says that he would have holy, or men lift up holy hands in prayer. Mm -hmm. I believe there is talking about the public out loud praying but in what we're looking at verses 1 and 2, it would be the general prayers that the congregation would offer up unto God. And typically, whenever we pray unto God, not everybody prays out loud, but one man prays on behalf of the whole. And everybody else can pray along with the person. They can say their own prayer. But it's an opportunity of prayer. And that's why I think it's so important, and we, we hear at Seminole Point, I think it's so important that, that men understand that when they're called upon to lead a public prayer, that their job is not to pray for their own sins at that moment or for their own wants and desires. It's on behalf of the congregation. And, and if you've got sin separating you from God, you deal with that privately before you go publicly because people are entrusting you to communicate with God. And the women who are sitting there, they're praying to God just as the men are sitting there praying to God. Yeah. This, this gets tied into some of the previous points in the lesson concerning how we're all, regardless of gender, equal heirs or heirs of grace in Christ. There is no male or female in terms of God's eternal judgment and your, and your rank before God as a, as a Christian. That's right. And it, the man does not have a faster avenue towards God because he is male. We all have an avenue of prayer through Jesus Christ. That's exactly right. Exactly right. And that goes back to Galatians 3.28 we talked about last week. Yeah. Because of our salvation, we are equal in the eyes of God. John, any thoughts? No, it's kind of quiet out there in the chat room so far tonight. Okay. We're going to try to touch some, some subject off here soon, I think. Right? Uh, we'll, we'll get it. <laughs> <laughs> well, the, the other, another aspect of worship is that of preaching. And any time the congregation assembles together, there can be a, a message bought, brought, a, a sermon preached. And the, the preaching part of worship is seen when honor is shown to our Heavenly Father. Every time His Word is proclaimed, every time we listen to His Word, we are proclaiming honor to the Lord. We're worshiping Him. The psalmist did the same thing. Let us show the same praise and gladness when we hear the Word of the Lord, just as David did. Psalms 1 and 2, but his delight is in the law of the Lord, and, he, and in His law he meditates 
day and night and other passages there. You'll see cross-reference there in the outline. David meditated upon the word of the Lord. He worshiped the Lord through giving honor to his word. And we do the same thing in worship service during the, the, the aspect of worship that we normally refer to as preaching. But it's also a time, per, a time period for teaching where the one who is preaching, there's nothing special about him. He's not up there on show. You know, he's not up there for everybody to look at. He's not even a professional public speaker to all and to woo the congregation. He is a presenter of the Word of God, a teacher of God's Word. Paul and Barnabas assembled with the church in Antioch and taught them in Acts 11, 26. In Acts 20, verse 7, Paul preached to a group of Christians until midnight. And in 1 Corinthians 14, 23 through 26, we'll talk about this a little bit later, it's all about edification. The Word is taught so that we might be edified. Mm -hmm. And in that, while there's one man who is teaching, everybody, men and women, are paying tribute to the Word of God through listening and through learning what His Word has to say. Well, there's plenty of examples of women teaching within the Scriptures, Priscilla and Aquila being one which we'll get into. And sure. Mm -hmm. Think about uh, Timothy's family, who taught him. That's right. Yeah. Lois and Eunice. Yes. Yeah, that's right. John? Yeah, when you look at, when you look at preaching, um, where does the emphasis seem to be? You have one preacher and you have a whole congregation of listeners. Yeah. Um, what's more important in that? The listening, obviously, is what's more important. The, 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 the um, receiving of the lesson and then the application, as we talked about here, uh, is what's truly the most important part of the preaching, not the, not the individual who just happens to have put the lesson together and standing there. He's not the sole purpose for that part of the worship service. The sole purpose right. is for us to receive uh, the lesson and hear it and, and, and reflect upon the Word of God and the Scriptures and, and find where we need to applicate, make application in our lives. That's exactly right. Again, that's what the preacher did when he prepared the lesson. That's the reason why he gets to stand up there to begin with, because he's already gone through the, the, the application and found where this application needs to be. And if he's doing what he should as a preacher, he's already applied it to himself. The first set of toes every teacher, preacher teps, uh, <laughs> steps on with every lesson should be his own. Right. You true. know, mm -hmm. should be his own. Luke? No, th those are good points, yeah. And, and I, I say this, and I really lean on this, because being a preacher and growing up and seeing many preachers throughout my life, and, and we have some in the, the chat room tonight, and maybe not, not on, only preachers, some men that have brought lessons, some who are preacher training as well. And it's very, there is a temptation for a preacher to, to develop a look at me. You know, where I'm gonna be up in front of everybody, I've gotta look sharp, I gotta look good, my hair doesn't need to be out of place. Yes, I like to brush my hair before I get up there. But now let, let me polish my presentation style in such a way that I'll be popular and people will like me. And I believe a preacher should do his best, but at the moment his, in his uh, motivations turn from how can I best teach the congregation to look at me and how good of a job I'm doing, then he's doing it only for show and he should get out of the pulpit. Get out of the pulpit. So. Um, Okay, any other thoughts about that before we look at another reason why we assemble together? Uh, Kevin in the chat room mentioned, and we talked a little bit about this last week, Titus 2, verse 3 and 4, as an example of the older women teaching the younger. Um, oh, yeah. Talking about the older women admonishing the younger women to love their husbands, to love their, uh, their children, to, to be homemakers, discreet. Going along so. with what Luke was mentioning a while ago, the different examples right. of women teachers. Right. That's right. I think Rhonda just took a shot at me. No, I think that was uh, no, that's that was a John. Oh, okay. Yeah. Well, I know I get tongue tangled. <laughs> no, that was mine. Oh. <laughs> <laughs> I hope it wasn't a reference to last night or the other night. <laughs> no, no, no. She <laughs> she she lobbied that one right at me. Or lobbed that one. Right. See, lobbied. <laughs> there you go. Yeah. If you got tongue tangled the other night, I missed it. Yeah. Hey, by the way, uh, Lou, at the last Sunday night of every month, we use different uh, of our young men to present the lesson the last Sunday evening. John's done it before. Luke has done it on several occasions as well, and I think we're going to be working Jimmy into doing it, and uh, Travis has already done it. And so if you go to the SeminalPoint.org website, you'll be able to uh, and click on sermons. You'll be able to go to the month of May and, and find the last one that Luke presented about spiritual blindness. So very fine lesson. But let's consider another, several other reasons why we assemble together, kind of just quickly here to, to you know, look at what women, men and women together can do. There were sometimes in the, when you go back to the first century, 
that the apostles called the church together to tend to certain responsibilities. Uh, we see in Acts 6, 1 through 4 where they called the congregation together in regards to tending to the, those who are widows indeed. You know, there may be instances where there's something specific that the church needs to deal with, and instead of waiting until Sunday or Sunday night, Sunday morning, Wednesday night, the church may be called together on a Monday evening so that the elders can sit down with the congregation and deal with whatever it needs to be dealt with. Um, what else, Luke? Oh, uh, two, two quick points, thoughts that I had about the, uh, sure. the mm -hmm. first point there. about the uh, Obviously, the, the scriptures are, are specific in terms of the role of deacons, that those are chosen men. Right. Um, but in terms of, of the preparing of meals or benevolence or any sort of work done within the congregation, women are just as much included as men, oh, which absolutely. you pointed out. Yeah. Um, the other, other purpose is obviously the role of evangelism. Uh, you pulled out Acts chapter 14, mm -hmm. verse 27, uh, as, as a role of the church supporting evangelism or evangelized th throughout the, the communities around them. Um, and obviously the support of, of a preacher uh, falls upon the, all Christians. That's right. Men and women. Exactly, exactly. Um, John, any thoughts from the chat room want to bring in here before we look at the last two uh, reasons why the church may assemble together? Yeah, we had a couple points in there. Um, it kind of Rhonda and Kevin's points kind of go together a little bit. Uh, okay. She mentioned that too often uh, preachers might want to become a motivational speaker and not a preacher of God's Word. Going back to the rant a while ago about that. Right. Yeah. And then Kevin uh, mentions that he knows that many men within the body who do not use their title, like doctor or something like that, when they're speaking. Uh, yet, of course, the way the world and uh, denominations is to focus on the fact that there's a doctor in front of their name. Uh, and he talks yeah. about that's regarding your, your point on humility. Uh, for those speaking or presenting the word. And then Craig pointed out, uh, Paul told Timothy why he is to preach in 2 Timothy 4, uh, looking at verses 1 through 5, uh, where he talked about he charged uh, Timothy there, uh, therefore before God and the mm -hmm. Lord Jesus Christ, who will judge the living and the dead, that is appearing and at his kingdom, preach the word, be ready in season and out of season, convince, rebuke, exhort with all long suffering and teaching. That's why men preach, right? or why men should preach. Mm -hmm. That's exactly right. It's a very good point. Another reason why a local church may assemble together, uh, sometimes, John, we have to talk about matters of difference. You know, may not fully agree. We see that in Acts 15, verse 4, uh, where the, the church there, you know, received Paul and, and the apostles, um, or received Paul and, who was the other one? Was it Paul and John or Paul and Silas? When in doubt, turn to Paul the and Bible. Barnabas. Paul and Barnabas, that's it. And then, I know James was there too, the brother of Jesus. Yeah, because they were called into question regarding Paul having baptized uh, the uh, Cornelius in his household, mm -hmm. and the the Holy the Spirit gift Spirit that they received there. And so there was a matter of difference that needed to be addressed and dealt with regarding the situation of the Gentiles. And so there there may be a time where the elders may have to call the congregation together and say, "Listen, we have some issues. We need to take care of these tonight." We need to consult what the Bible has to say. Well, I was moving forward also to the, the, in that same chapter, I believe it was, where they had the meeting about the Judaizing teachers. Wasn't that? I would think so in Acts chapter 15 there. Yeah. yeah. Um, just because you, you can't always wait till five minutes after services, Sunday morning or Sunday night, to deal with things. Mm -hmm. And if the eldership of the congregation says to the congregation, we need to be here Monday night because we've got to address some issues, every member of the congregation is, is, is responsible to be there because they are a part of the whole. Mm -hmm. And it's just something that I think far too often people say, well, that's, you know, my church time is Sunday morning, maybe Sunday night, possibly Wednesday night. Don't call on me any other night of the week there. And it's just not the way that it should be, obviously. It was uh, the, the Gentiles mm -hmm. and the partaking of uh, regarding blood and, 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 and so forth like that there. Um, so we could do that as well. Another example, women, men, both participate on an equal fashion in those settings. The last one we have there to discipline the unruly. It doesn't always have to be right before the worship service on Sunday. It doesn't have to be set right afterwards. Again, the elders can call the congregation together and say, look, we have an unruly member, here's what we, and they deal with it. You know, so. But the point is, and the reason why I broke it down like that is to show that yes, the church does assemble together. And men and women both have a part to play in all of those. Even if it's sitting there as a member, recognizing their responsibility or their understanding that's required of them, that is the part that they play, both men and women. Okay, 
That's the first work of the local church, to assemble together. But Luke, we also, we talked about this briefly just a moment ago. We have responsibility to evangelize, don't we, as a local congregation. Yeah, First Timothy chapter 3 talks about the purpose of the church being the pillar and support of the truth. Right. I mean, if you want to sum up, take a verse to sum up the role of the church, uh, universal and the local congregation, it is that verse. That's right. And yeah. for the church to, to, to function as the pillar and support of the truth, as Paul says, it takes the... Um, takes the work of all members, male and female. That's right, exactly. Being grounded in the truth and working at fulfilling the roles appropriately. You know, Kevin makes a comment in the chat room there, and I'll, I'll go and throw this one in, John, because this is, talks to you more about what we're, would apply to what we're talking about tonight, is that they were all believers, both men and women. Everybody who was there was a part of the church, were believers. Um, and that would apply to the very point of evangelism that we're talking about. Um, would it be possible for a congregation, for the elderships, to say we we want to send uh, brother and sister so and so out to this neighborhood to go and pass out flyers and offer to study with people? Yes. Well, absolutely, yeah. If a woman of the congregation works with a friend of hers who who is willing to study with her, then by all means, she's doing her part as an individual, but also as a part of that local body to support and uphold the truth. There, mm -hmm. John, any thoughts? No. Nope. Okay. <laughs> and then the last work of the church we'll just mention briefly, and we've talked about this before, and I'm sure we'll study it more in, in another study in detail again. But we are looking at church benevolence as well. You know, church benevolence is another work that we do. Again, an area wherein both men and women can do their part. Okay. Very, very clear, very understandable. What we're going to do is go ahead and take our first break this evening. And when we come back, we're going to look at the woman's involvement in the work of the local church and kind of specifically address what you would might say would be limitations. You know, this is what people really jump on, you know, and we won't look at what the Bible has to say. Any thoughts before we continue, gentlemen? Okay, stay tuned. We will be right back. Hello, I'm Ron Witt, one of the elders of the Seminole Point Church of Christ. On behalf of the elders and members of the Seminole Point Church of Christ, I would like to invite you to be our guest at any of our worship services and Bible classes. The meeting place of the Seminole Point Church of Christ is located at 16300 North May Avenue, Oklahoma City, Oklahoma, zip code 73013. The Seminole Point Church of Christ meets Sunday mornings at 930 for Bible classes. 10.30 for worship service, and 5 p.m. for our afternoon worship service. We also have Bible classes on Wednesdays at 7 p.m. Whether you live in Oklahoma City area or you are traveling through Oklahoma City, we would love to have you come and be our guest. We have Bible classes for all ages. At the Seminole Point Church of Christ, our focus is to teach only the Word of God. Rest assured that when you visit with us, you will find that we will appeal only to God's precious word. Now, let us return to our study. Kevin brought up a good point in the chat room. Um, he said that according to Acts 5.14, and believers were increasingly added to the Lord, multitudes of both men and women. The fact that multitudes of both men and women were added shows that God is no respecter of persons. And the limitations that we're about to talk about has nothing to do with ability, has nothing to do with God's viewing women to be lesser than men. It's simply about roles, simply about roles within the local congregation. Now be sure to let us know what you think. If you have a comment about something that we've said, maybe if we've missed a point, missed a verse that you think would help the study, please bring it in. If you disagree with something, don't hesitate to let us hear that as well. Be more than happy to consider any comments or questions that you have. Well, Luke, I'll tell you what let's do. Let's start with 1 Corinthians chapter 14, verses 34 through 35. This is one of the more well-known yeah. passages of sorts. So let's go ahead and read that one. Okay. Uh, beginning of verse 34, it says, Let your women keep silent in the churches, for they are not permitted to speak. But they are to be submissive, as the law also says. If they want to learn, it, learn something, let them ask their own husbands at home, for it is shameful for women to speak in church. Now this is one of those cases where you could very easily pull the verse out of context. 
you know, and say, women, you know, you sit down, you've got to sit on the back pew, and you cannot say a word. You cannot say anything. But I think it's important that we establish the context of this. When we look at verses 6 through 12, we see the Apostle Paul here is examining the purpose of the various gifts. Primarily, that purpose would have been for edification. Yes. You know, so that everybody may learn, everybody might be taught, both the learned and the unlearned. Then when you step down to verses 13 through 19 of 1 Corinthians 14, Paul here is showing the importance of understanding what is being spoken. He states in verse 18 that he would rather speak five words with understanding than 10,000 words in a tongue. That then brings us, let's look at verse 19, we'll bring it up on the chart there. He says, yet in the church, I would rather speak five words with my understanding that I may teach others also than 10,000 words in a tongue. Now, you'll notice there, John, he gives a Greek word there that's translated as yet in the church. What is that Greek word? Um, ecclesia. Yeah, ecclesia. Yeah. Very simple definition. It's a gathering of citizens called out from their homes into some public place and assembly. And what we find is we will look through this chapter here, he's talking about the assembly. He's not talking about a group of Christians that we normally call like the church at Ephesus or the church of Philadelphia. He's talking about the assembly of those people together coming out there. Um, helps us to understand the context of this even better. Luke, look at verse 23. Verse 23 says, Therefore, if the whole church comes together in one place and all speak with tongues, and there comes in those who are uninformed or unbelievers, will they not say that you are out of your mind? All right, notice the phrase comes together. Mm -hmm. A little bit different Greek word, isn't it? Yeah, slightly. Sooner kamahi. Yeah, slightly different than ecclesia there. I can pronounce ecclesia, but that one not so much. <laughs> I think you did fine. <laughs> Sooner, you know. Um, it means to come together, to assemble together. So he says there, you know, if the whole church comes together, coming together in one place for one reason, a particular reason there, we see here a reference to the assembly. And he also makes a point there that in this assembly, there could be some who are unbelievers, some who were uninformed. When we study the scriptures, we don't find anything about a closed worship where you know, we have a worship service only for the faithful members and then we'll have a special one for those who are unbelievers. Unbelievers can be present during the worship service. Now, word it like that, be present. I've seen some churches who would put on a sign, let's say a billboard, come worship with us. I hesitate in using the terminology with people that I know who aren't Christians saying come worship with us. You know, it's my own little personal thing there. I would pr rather say come be our guest, come visit with us. Let's sit down and study together type, type phraseology there with that one. And then let's take a look at verse 26 there. We see another reference to this. We're just establishing the context here. John, why don't you read that for us? Verse 26 says, How is it then, brethren, whenever you come together, each of you has a psalm, has a teaching, has a tongue, has a revelation, has an interpretation. Let all things be done for edification. All right, the term come together, that phrase, the same thing as what Luke looked at a while ago in verse 23 there. And so when you come together, he's talking about the assembly. During this assembly that Paul is addressing here, they apparently exercised various gifts that they had been given. Some of them had a gift of song. Some had a gift of teaching. Some had a gift of tongue, of revelation, of interpretation. But we come back to look what we said well ago, that everything that was done was done for a singular purpose. Edification. Exactly. To edify one another. Mm -hmm. Nothing that we find here, and this is, what we're, this is what they were dealing with in part, and we're going to look at this here in a second. None of the gifts that God gave were intended to elevate one person above the rest. You know, someone may have a beautiful singing voice, but that doesn't mean that he should dominate the role of song leader. You know, an individual may, may be a brilliant orator, but that doesn't mean that he dominates the teaching process within the congregation. You may have a man that may be able to lead a 10-minute eloquent prayer, but that doesn't mean that he leads all the prayers. Mm -hmm. You know, we, we, are all, we all have our work and role within the local congregation. And he's in the process now of establishing some rules for this that ultimately will help us understand what he said about and to women. So, any thoughts before we need to go on there in the chat room? Or? Uh, two things real quick. Yeah, if, if you read from the New American Standard, it actually, in the 
the phrase y'all are using that to come together, the New American Center used the word assembly when you come in this, to the assembly, yeah. which I thought was interesting. And, and this, I just want to reiterate a point. The reason that we're going through these verses about uh, the calling out of the assembly is coming together as the assembly is we're pointing out that the context of chapter 14 is dealing with the church coming together as a congregation. We're not dealing with exactly. assembling in someone's home or at work or in any other place. We're talking about the church coming together to fulfill its function that we talked about early, such as singing, praying, preaching, teaching. That's right. Uh, the, the taking up the collection and so forth. Context is everything. Yes. And, and, it is, and what we're looking at are, is limited to the worship service within 1 Corinthians 14. Mm -hmm. John, any thoughts about that? Uh, no, I don't think so. Okay. One thing I want to throw before we hit to this, uh, to verses 27 through 40, and um, I've lost the passage right offhand, but when James makes the point um, of not, I thought it was James chapter 2 there, um, he talks about when, with, when one when one comes in to their assembly. That's James chapter 2, verses 1 through, there we through. 4 or 5. That's it. Notice he says there specifically there that for if, verse two, verse 2, for if there should come into your assembly a man with gold rings. If I remember the Greek there, it's the same word that's also translated as synagogue or synagogue. Hmm. And one brother suggested one time that this may have been an indirect reference to them using the synagogue as a place to worship, not worshiping the Lord by Old Testament means and methods, but by using that gathering place as a place to worship God. It's an interesting point, you know, there with that one. So let's look at any thoughts there before we go on, John. Yeah, Craig pointed out in the chat room, 1 Thessalonians there, mm -hmm. uh, uh, mentioning there that uh, in verse 1 and verse 3 and verse 7, verse uh, we can see the church has become an example there, um, and uh, Paul has, has given thanks for them. And then verse 3 talks about how they were uh, remembering without ceasing their work of faith. Uh, right. Paul remembered their work of faith, labor and love, and patience of hope. And then in verse 7, so that you became an example to all in Macedonia and Achaia who believe. So it talks about the Thessalonians there being an example, and he mentions here that's not just it didn't point out the men of the church in right. Thessalonians. It was the church. It was all those that made up that body of people uh, worshiping together their men and women. Exactly, exactly. And Kevin makes a good point. He says, yes, the majority of division among people is the lack of following simple con context clues that children are taught in elementary school, especially when viewing these verses we're studying tonight that could be construed as opposites. Yeah, exactly. Well, let's look at verses 27 through 40. I would suggest that there are four rules that Paul's giving. Now, I know we're supposed to be talking about the rules that limit women, but we're going to find rules that limit, limit both men and women. But this is important to understand the context there. So let's look at rule number one. Let's read 1 John 14, 27 through 28. The apostle Paul wrote, If anyone speaks in a tongue, let, he, let there be two or three at the most, each in turn, and let one interpret. But if there is no interpreter, let him keep silent in church and let him speak to himself and to God. So rule number one, during the worship service of the assembly there in Corinth, when they came together, for those with the gift of speaking in tongues, they were only to speak two or three and each in turn. Not all together, but fellow one, fellow two, and fellow three. There had to be present one who could interpret what was being said. If nobody was there to, to interpret, and this is important now, then the person speaking in tongues was to be silent. Now there's two key words. We won't talk about them right now. We'll, we'll save them for later in the study. But notice the word silent and notice the word speaks. Very important to further here in, in our discussion. All right, so Luke, let's look at rule number two. Uh, rule number two is found down in... Uh verses 29 through 32. I'll go ahead and read those. Mm -hmm. So let two or three prophets speak and let the others judge. But if anything is revealed to another who sits by, let the first keep silent. You can all prophesy one by one that all may learn and all may be encouraged and the spirits of the prophets are subject to the prophets. Uh, so what was the rule here we see? Um, <clears throat> let two or three sparks let the others judge. It is it, basically laying out the order about how the prophet should speak so that it's not chaos all speaking one, over one another and let the others judge what they say so that all can be encouraged. Okay. And what we find here is the spirit of the prophet is subject to himself. Yes. 
You know, it's not where God's going to move you beyond your control. You know, you, this, the prophet has control over when he speaks there. And so they were to limit it to two or three who speak. And if one fellow was going on and someone said, I got something to say, the first one was to be silent while the other one spoke. Again, very important, those two words there. Let two or three prophets speak. Remember that word till later. And then he says, let the first keep silent there in verse 30 if someone else has something to say. Two key words. Any thoughts about that? No. Okay. John, let's look at rule number three. Uh, rule number three we see here uh, has specifically to do with the, the women in this case. Okay. First uh, Corinthians chapter 14, verse 34 and 35, where it says, Let your women keep silent in the churches, for they are not permitted to speak, but they are to be submissive, as the law also says. And if they want to learn something, let them ask their own husbands at home, for it is shameful for women to speak in church. All right, so very straightforward that the women here were to keep silent in the churches, in the assembly of the congregation. That's the context. Now again, notice the word, it is not permitted to speak, and notice the word silent, as in keep silent. We'll talk about those here in just a moment, very important. And then rule number four, quite simple, going back to verse 40, let all things be done decently and in order. And I would suggest that regarding this passage that those are the four rules that Paul was reminding the brethren Corinth that they needed to abide by so that things could be done decently and in order. And Luke, Paul tells us in verse 33 the reason, essentially the reason for these rules. Yeah. Verse 33 says, God is not a God of confusion, but of peace, as in all the churches of the saints. Okay. So the context of 1 Corinthians 14 is about the local assembly, is about the local worship service unto God and the rules that must be maintained. And I've often thought about this. It's interesting that he puts a time limit on how long the worship service goes. Someone, someone says, what do you mean a time limit? Well, only two, no more than three men who spoke in tongues and two, no more than three men who prophesied. He puts a limit on it. And if someone is speaking and someone else is moved to say something, then the first one needs to be silent and let the other one speak. You know, and I, you know, I, kind, of, I kind of use that kind of half-heartedly, but it shows that preachers shouldn't preach too long. <laughs> <laughs> um, Lansing told me, I used to talk to Lansing about a Foye Wallace. Foye, Foye Wallace used to preach at the 10th and Francis Church of Christ for about two years back in 1922. And um, early, early in his uh, life as a preacher, he was a very good orator. And Lansing told me one time, he said, Foy Wallace would only have three points to a sermon. He'd take an hour on the first point, an hour on the second point, <laughs> and an hour on the third point. But that was back when men were real men and women were real, real women, and you could sit for three hours and listen to a gospel sermon. <laughs> But anyway, take it for what it's worth. I just find it interesting that he does the limit. Yeah. Ultimately, the number of participations of this miraculous caliber in the worship service. Yeah. All right, any thoughts about this before we go on? Uh, one comment I want to point out, it's interesting how while Paul deals specifically with uh, specific roles, specific, uh, like uh, the miraculous gifts, prophecy, speaking in tongues, who mm -hmm. should speak, when to speak, how to speak, the, the general theme he's laying out here is not just for those activities, but it shows us how the worship service in general should be conducted in right. order. While he doesn't specify, well, this is how you take the Lord's Supper, we know that the Lord's Supper should be done in order. That's right. With respect um, and, and so forth. That's a good point. Things not mentioned in this chapter would still fall with under the instructions of decently and in order. Yes. You know, even the songs that we sing need to be done decently and in order. It's mm -hmm. good thought. Good thought there. So let's go ahead and take <coughs> our second break for this evening. And then we come back, we're going to kind of look at the, so what? You know, now really tell us what the passage means there mm -hmm. and how do we understand it. And in the end, when we're done, and you may not agree with our conclusion, because for probably every commentary there is, there's probably a variation of way of looking at these two verses there. But just give some thought and see if what the conclusion at least we've reached makes a measure of sense. So stay tuned. We will be right back. Hi, I'm Rhonda. I'm a member of the Seminole Point Church of Christ in Oklahoma City, Oklahoma. 
The Seminole Point Church of Christ has outstanding Bible classes for all ages. We have teachers who are dedicated to teaching God's Word in insightful and energetic ways. Please come visit us and bring your children. They will love our Bible classes and you will be benefited. Hello, my name is Dale Decker. I am one of four elders here at Seminole Point Church of Christ. We are very fortunate to have a Bible-loving group of Christians here at Seminole. Our Bible class teachers are second to none. We have Bible classes for all age groups. Our goal is heaven, and we make every effort to ensure that the Word of God is taught at every age group. We hope that you will come and check us out. You will find that we are a very friendly and loving congregation. We are located at 16,300 May Avenue in Oklahoma City. And now back to our study. By the window, <laughs> he did. <laughs> he sure did. Um, Alan in the in the chat room said midnight is the cutoff. That's, uh, that's uh, I like that one. We don't want anyone falling out of windows. Yeah, I mean, people would step to the midnight to watch the Thunder game, so surely. <laughs> <laughs> um, Daniel makes the point. He says the mind can only comprehend what the body can endure, and that's a pretty good point. You've stretched my limit sometimes, John. I have. <laughs> I always thought you were agreeing with me when your head was nodding. <laughs> well, let's go back to the passage again. 1 Corinthians 14, 34 through 35. And John, if you would read this for us again. Sure. Verse 34 is, Let your women keep silent in the churches, for they are not permitted to speak, but they are to be submissive, as the law also says. And if they want to learn something, let them ask their own husbands, at home, for it is shameful for women to speak in church. Okay. And I, I will admit again, this is somewhat, especially when you look at the latter part of this, and if they want to learn something, let them ask their own husbands at home. Okay. It kind of gives us maybe an insight as to what might have been going on during this process. But before we talk about it, let's actually define some more words there. And I think, Jimmy, we, we do have these on the charts, don't we? Okay. The first word I want to define is that of woman. And the Greek word there is gune, and it means a woman of any age, whether a virgin or a married or a widow, a wife or of a betrothed woman. Okay, so basically anyone of the female <coughs> gender, and whether they're a young person or they're an older person. All right, uh, John, how about churches? You want to give us that definition again? Ecclesia, you give me an easy one, thank you. <laughs> We're translated as a church 115 times and assembly three times. Right meaning a gathering of citizens called out from their homes into some public place or assembly. Okay. Now, there are times that ecclesia refers to the body of Christ. Upon this rock I'll build my ecclesia, my church there. There were instances where it referred to local congregations. The churches of Christ salute you, Romans 16, 16. The ecclesias of Christ there salute you. But in this context, it's talking about the assembly. We saw that in verse 19, verse 23, and then in verse 26. Mm -hmm. Okay, so that's, those are pretty well cleared and understood. All right, but now Luke, let's, let's talk about the word silence for just a moment. I told you we'd bring this word up later in our study. Yeah, this was a verse we've seen several times over. The, the Greek word silence is the pronounced sigayo, for what that's worth, to keep silence, hold one's peace, to ke be kept in silence, or to conceal. We see that in verse 28 and verse 30 about the uh, speaking in tongues and the prophesying. That's right. And also, of course, with women, verse 34 and 35. That's right, and, and let's, let's just kind of remember that. If a man was speaking in tongues, or had the gift, but there was no interpreter, Paul clearly said, let him be silent. That is Siago. The man who had the gift of prophecy, if someone else stood up to speak, the first man had to be silent, Siago, or Sigayo, Sigayo. The woman, let her be silent, Sigayo. It's the same word with the same meaning to keep silence, hold one's peace, as you read just a moment ago. And so if we approach verse 34 with the understanding that within this context, the usage of sigayo means to address this, or means to not address the assembly, then in verse 34, it would seem to be that Paul is telling the woman not to address the assembly. The man speaking in tongue could not address the assembly. The one with the gift of prophecy could not address the assembly. The woman was not to address the assembly. Um, if we use the word consistently in all three of those settings there. Mm -hmm. All right, let's look at another word, speak. <coughs> we see the word speak several times within this text there. Lael, it means to utter a voice or emit a sound, to speak, to talk, to utter, tell to use words in order to declare one's mind and disclose one's thoughts. Now, laleo is used several times within the same context. 
In talking about the men speaking in tongues, let them speak. Laleo. With a man who has a gift of prophecy, let him speak. Laleo. All right, let him address the assembly of the congregation. When we come down to verse 34, he says a, suffer not a, a, a woman is not to speak. I would think if we used it in the same way that it's used in each of the previous verses, she's not to publicly address the assembly of the congregation there. Uh, we'll talk about singing a little bit later. We'll talk about correcting children. We'll talk about standing up and the preacher says, do you believe Christ is the Son of God? The woman says, I do. You know. In this case, though, it is clearly the woman addressing the assembly the way that the others would be doing so. Uh, but before we talk further about it, let's go to the next word, the next phrase, Luke. Okay, we have uh, the word submissive, hupatasso, uh, means to arrange under, to be subordinate, to subject or put in subjection, to subject oneself, obey, subject to one's control, to yield to one's admonition or advice, to obey, to be subject. That's what we find there in um, um, uh, verse 34, mm -hmm. let them be subject to themselves, just as the law also says. Exactly. It's a willingness to yield control or to have that spirit of subjection. Mm -hmm. In other words, let the worship service take place and they do their part as members of the congregation. They don't try to push themselves above and beyond their role within that local church. Mm -hmm. um, John Daniel makes a point. Uh, well, let's bring in here real quickly about Acts 9 verse 31 there. And Daniel, you'll have to remind us which of these words there. Are you talking about Ecclesia? Oh, Ecclesia. Yeah, okay. Right. Acts 9 verse 31, Then the churches throughout all Judea, Galilee, and Samaria had peace and were edified, and walking in the fear of the Lord and in the comfort of the Holy Spirit, they were multiplied. More than likely referencing the individual congregations in a collective fashion throughout, mm -hmm. or collective reference, I should say. Yeah, that's a good point. So someone says, okay, so what's your point? The point, the conclusion you might say, is in 1 Corinthians 14, 34 through 35, forbids women from teaching in a public manner during the assembly of the local congregation. The woman is to recognize her role in the church and willingly submit herself accordingly. Now let's pause there for just a moment. When it says if she has a question, let her ask her husband. I, think it's, I don't think it's the case in point where she leans over and says, <laughs> you know, but where possibly the woman would say, I'm sorry, what was that? <laughs> you know, possibly, possibly. Um, again, different, there are different views on this, different takes on it. 1 Corinthians 14, 34 through 35, it does not advocate the total silence on the part of the woman. To say this passage told the woman to be utterly and totally silenced would be to contradict other Bible passages. So what would be an example of something that that would contradict Luke? Oh, well, I think the one that was most obvious in my mind was the aspect of singing. We're all commanded to sing. Yeah. That would demand them to, to be, say something aloud during the assembly. Exactly. And I tell you what, some women are loud singers. <laughs> <laughs> so are men. And some of us song leaders appreciate that. <laughs> exactly. Um, and so that's, and now here's, if you had a woman who stood up and began to sing a solo, she in a matter of speaking is addressing the assembly of the congregation. But when we all sing together, She's not addressing the assembly. They are all praising God, mm -hmm. singing praises unto God. A difference being seen there. John, what about the public confession? Right, yeah, a woman would obviously um, would uh, follow the same um, guidelines as a man would uh, in obeying yeah. the gospel. And in making that confession of Christ in Romans 10, verse 9 and 10, we see there. And if we're going to extend the invitation to become a Christian to everyone present, man or woman, right. we would expect both man or woman to um, respond in the same way. Exactly. Give them the opportunity. Do you believe? Now, I don't, I don't believe confession is a separate step that you simply go through the motions. You know, it, it is more than simply saying, I believe. Mm -hmm. But we do ask everybody publicly in front of all people so that all people will know that, yes, this person believes and preachers not speaking for them. Mm -hmm. you know, they, and so we give them that opportunity. And a woman couldn't. You know, even someone who's, who, who is an alien sinner about to become a Christian would not be able to do that if 1 Corinthians 14, 34, and 35 cut out speaking altogether. Yeah. Mm -hmm. um, and think about responsibility regarding her children. I mean, how would it look if the mother was sitting there and little Johnny was throwing a fit and the mother couldn't say a word to Johnny? 
I mean, someone said, yeah, but she could slap them, and yeah, maybe so, but you try to use the softer methods first. You, know, you, you communicate with them. You, you want to tell them, no, don't do that. And so there's going to be times where being the proper mother and working with her husband, that they do reprimand their children. Mm-hmm. You know? And so it would be one of those cases that that is not being referenced there. Yeah. So any, any thoughts on this particular section, guys? Uh, I mean, I think basically we've surmised is that you have to look at what the manner of speaking is. If we're talking mm-hmm. about addressing the assembly as Paul was in 1 Corinthians 14, that according to the gospel, this apostle, inspired by the Holy Spirit, women is not to speak for the assembly. That's right. But they speak during the assembly. They have to in certain, in certain, in certain aspects. So That's right. Now, and this is why we, we specified, we're talking about women preachers. We're talking about women who stand up in front of a congregation that is comprised of faithful men and standing up there in the position of leadership and preaching to those faithful men. It's just Paul says, let it not be done. Let the women keep silent in that capacity there. Women can teach anywhere else. Uh, and what I mean by that is go home and, and, and teach your child. If you have an unbelieving husband, teach your unbelieving husband. Teach your next door neighbor. I don't think women are limited to only teaching women. If your next door neighbor has, uh, let's say you're single and your neighbor and her husband want to be taught, you can sit down and begin the teaching process. I don't see anywhere in the Bible, Priscilla and Aquila, they taught Apollos. There's nowhere in the Bible that would prevent a woman from doing that. You know, so the, you know, a lot of times someone say, well, your church doesn't let women be preachers, so they're, they're cutting women short of their potential. No, they're not. There's certain limitations to the roles. There's so much that both men and women can do in the work of our Lord and Savior. So, so much so. Well, let's go ahead and take a look at 1 Timothy 2, 11 through 15. Turn in your Bibles there. This is a, another guideline, if you would, that must be considered there. So, Look, if you would read that, let's look at verses 11 through 15 of 1 Timothy chapter 2. Okay. <clears throat> Let a woman learn in silence with all submission, and I do not permit a woman to teach or to have authority over a man, but to be in silence. For Adam was first formed, then Eve, and Adam was not deceived, but the woman being deceived fell into transgression. Nevertheless, she will be saved in childbearing if they continue in faith, love, holiness with self-control. Now, let's look at a couple of definitions within this. Again, Context is everything. What was Paul talking about here when he says, let the women learn in silence with all submission? Uh, the Greek word translated as woman, gune, we talked about that earlier. Same classification of women. They're just women in general, female, women there. Um, female, comma, women. So, Now, silence. This one is a little bit different, John. Okay, the, the word silent we saw earlier, this is a little bit different. Um, go ahead and read that one. Sure, you would throw that to me, would you? Um, hey, Sukiya. That sounds good to me. Um, quietness, uh, basically a description of the life of one who stays at home doing his own work and does not officiously meddle with the affairs of others. Okay. It is this particular word, if memory serves correctly, that's going to be used in reference to elders. I mentioned that earlier before the broadcast. There's one of these words there that's going to use be used in the description of the mannerism. You know, and I think this is it right here. The idea that the older that the woman is to be in quietness and it's basically a general description of who that person is about their life there. There's, there's a good Go parallel verse over in First Peter uh, chapter 3. I'll, just the first three verses I'll read them real quick. In the same way you wives be submissive to your own husbands that even if any of them are disobedient to the word they may be won without a word by the behavior of their wives as they observe your chaste and reciprocal behavior and let not your dormant be merely external, beating the hair, or wearing gold jewelry, or putting on dresses. Here's the verse. But let mm-hmm. it be the hidden person of the heart with the imperishable quality of a gentle and quiet spirit. That it, that's it right there, with, which is precious in the sight of the Lord. It's referring to their manner of character, of right. submission, of humility, of, of them fulfilling their roles to their husband and to the church ultimately also. That's right. That's right. Um, Alan makes a good point, and I want to uh, kind of reiterate this. We said it a while ago, but I want to make sure it's very clear. Um, what we're talking about would be men who are not believers, okay? And we're talking about men who are not believers um, in regards to the um, to not to teach over or to usurp authority over. It would exclude the men who are not believers. And Alan pulls from I think this is Alan's point there. He pulls it from Acts chapter eight, verse four there, where the apostle Paul. Um, 
He says there, therefore those who are scattered went everywhere preaching the word. These were believing, not simply just not simply men, but all believers. Mm -hmm. Yeah. yeah. Um, any thoughts, John, before we look at subjection? I do, but I'm still formulated in my mind. Okay. So I'll right. hold it for now until it makes a good point, or maybe we'll just have to wait until next week. All right, Luke, go, go ahead. Let's talk about the word subjection here real quick. All right, subjection, uh, hupotage, the act of subjecting, or obedience to subjection. Um, it's from the Greek word hupotasso that we read in 1 Corinthians 14. Exactly, yeah, yeah, a very similar word to that. So the point is, let the woman learn in silence with all submission or subjection. Okay, that's where we're going to with this. And then it says, and I, I do not permit a woman to teach or to have authority over a man there, or the King James says to usurp authority. That word there is authentio, or authentio, I'm sorry. One who acts on his own authority, an absolute master to govern, exercise, domain over. So when he says, I suffer not a woman to teach over, to usurp authority over man, is the idea of where she acts upon her own authority. Now we're talking about the working of the local congregation. Uh, Paul tells Timothy, 1 Timothy 2.15, I write these things so you may know how you ought to, be, ought to behave yourself in the church of God, which is the household of God, the pillar and ground of truth. So these instructions are pertaining to the woman's work within the local congregation. And I think within even the, the local assembly that we're looking at here. Okay, so any thoughts? I guess that brings to me to my question just to clarify. Um, yes. We've talked about that being the local assembly, that specifically where we're talking about the guidelines for the women and, sure. and their, their speaking. And then we've gone in and said that the women can go and, and of course they can teach the children at home. And you were mentioning they can teach um, friends who, who may not have believed yet. And so my question comes to, because we've kind of said we're applying it to just the congregation, but then when we talked about what they can do outside the church, we've kind of steered away from saying they could teach you know, a believer outside the church. And then we come to this passage where it talks about usurping authority and, and the woman to be learned in silence. Um, so the question I have is, if the woman is doing things respectfully, mm -hmm. And of course, let me let me caveat this first off by saying, if the woman is living as a Christian should live, as a Christian woman should live, she's already teaching others okay. through her life, through her manner of living. Uh, others, Christians and, and non-Christians, will see her, see her life, and recognize something about it, and will learn from that. And so, with that said, um, let's say it's a husband and wife, and both are believers. Okay. Um, now, of course, if they're doing a Bible study and the husband is leading it back and forth. I wouldn't see anything wrong with the woman being just as um, involved in the Bible study. Right. If they're both teaching the children, the husband and the wife would both be involved in the teaching. Um, but would there be an issue with the woman actually leading the Bible study over, not over, but maybe for her husband? And, and what I'm thinking about mm -hmm. there is maybe specifically where the woman has been a Christian for many years and the husband has just become a Christian. Would it, would it, is there something wrong with the wife at home actually leading and discussing in the discussion in the Bible study with the husband. As long as she's not doing it from a standpoint of, I have control of this, I'm, right. you know, in some way. I've, I've heard it explained, a preacher years ago told me that, that you look at this expression like this, that Paul is saying, I suffer not a woman to teach over or usurp authority over a man. So if you've got a woman who teaches her husband, he's a babe in Christ, and they're going to, they're going to do their baby daily Bible studies. A simple way to cover that would be for the woman to say, "Hun, do you mind if I go ahead and kind of, for a while, kind of teach you? And if the husband says, not at all, please do, she's not usurping any authority right. you know, whatsoever. Um, if the husband says, nope, I want to teach the class, and then the woman kind of bulldoze over him, then yeah, she would be usurping his authority. Right. Um, that's kind of a good explanation I heard years ago about that particular right. setting. And I just wanted to bring that up because we yeah. had touched on it, yeah. and as we were talking about outside the congregation, we didn't. We kind of steered away from. Yeah, we don't want to leave the impression that a woman cannot give instruction to a faithful Christian mm -hmm. man. I mean, I think about the number of times, especially as a preacher, and when I was a younger preacher. You know, I tell you what, some of the most knowledgeable people within the church I found have been older women. You know, I've got good instructions from older men, but there's been a time or two that an older woman would have to pull me inside and say, you kind of missed the mark on this one. Mm -hmm. Well, is she usurping authority? No. Is she teaching me? Absolutely. Mm -hmm. You know, and there's nothing wrong with that. Right. If there is, then we, we would seriously have to call into question about a woman teaching her son because he tells fathers 
to raise up their children in the admonition of the Lord. Not mothers, if we want to be very technical about it. Mm -hmm. So one would try to argue, could try to argue that a woman cannot even teach her son. Well, Timothy shows that otherwise. Exactly, with Lois and Eunice. Yeah. But then they'd say his father wasn't a Christian, so they had to. <laughs> well, I would think in John's case that he gives about the, the new convert of a husband and, a more, and the, the wife being the more mature, mm -hmm. um, knowledgeable Christian, I would think in God's eyes she would be obligated to share with him the knowledge she had gained through the years of experience as a Christian, him being a new convert. Well, our siren is going off. I think, I think you're right. I tell you what we're going to do. We're going to go ahead and close this broadcast to uh, bring it to a close because we've just heard the tornado sirens. Now that doesn't mean there's one located in our area. It just means that there's a possibility that one could form in our area. And we're out of time, so that kind of is well timed there. <laughs> what we'll do next week is we will continue with this lesson. There's a few more points. We were almost done, not quite done, a little bit more we could look at. So join us next week as we take a continue continuing our look at the woman's role within the work of the local church and what does the Bible say about women preachers. Thank you much. We'll make this a real quick sign off. And keep, our, keep watching us on Facebook and Google Plus, and you'll see whether or not we survive. Until next week, <laughs> we'll see you Tuesday night at 7.30 p.m. Central Standard Time right here at scripturalway.org.